Section 8 of Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cambridge Medieval History, Volume 1, Section 8. Chapter 3. Constantine's Successors to Jovian and the Struggle with Persia. By Norman H. Baines. Part 2. The importance and significance of this unsuccessful bid for empire may easily be overlooked. A Roman civil official at the head of some discontented spirits at the court hatches a plot against his sovereign, and in order to win the support of the army, alienated by the contempt of Constance, induces a barbarian general to declare himself emperor. But though the Roman world was willing enough that Germans should fight the empire's battles in their defense, they were not prepared to see another Maximin upon the throne. They refused to be reconciled to Magnentius even by the admitted justice of his rule. The lesson of his failure was well learned. The barbarian Arbogast caused not himself but the Roman civilian Eugenius to be elected emperor. Further, while in this struggle the eastern and western halves of the empire are seen falling naturally and almost unconsciously asunder, the most powerful force working for unity is the dynastic sentiment. Constantius claims support as the legitimate successor of the house of Constantine, and as the avenger of the death of his son. His claim is not merely as the chosen of the senate or army, but far more as the rightful heir to the throne. This struggle throws into prominence the growth of the hereditary principle and the warmth of the response which it could evoke from the sympathies of the subjects of the empire. No student of the history of the fourth century can indeed afford to neglect the Battle of Mursa. Contemporaries were staggered at the appalling loss of life, for, while it is said that the Roman dead numbered 40,000 at Hadrianople, A.D. 378, at Mursa, 54,000 are reported to have been slain. It is hardly too much to say that the defense of the empire in the east was crippled by this blow, and it must have been largely through the slaughter at Mursa that Constantius was forced to make his fatal demand that the troops of Gaul should march against Persia. Neither must the military significance of the battle be forgotten, it lies in the fact that this was the first victory of the newly formed heavy cavalry, and the result of the impact of their charge, which carried all before it, showed that it was no longer the legionary who was to play the most important part in the campaigns of the future. Meanwhile, in Antioch, Gallus was ruling as an oriental despot. There was in his nature a strain of savagery, and his appointment as Caesar seems to have awakened within him a brutal lust for a naked display of unrestrained authority. His passions were only fed by the violence of Constantia. The unsuccessful plot of Magnentius to assassinate the Caesar aroused the latter's suspicions, and a reign of terror began. Judicial procedure was disregarded, and informers honored. Men were condemned to death without trial, and the members of the city council imprisoned. When the populace complained of scarcity, it was suggested that the responsibility lay with Theophilus, governor of Syria. The mob took the hint, and the governor perished. The feeling of insecurity was rendered more intense by a rising among the Jews, who declared a certain Patricius their king, and by the raids of Saracens and Azorians upon the countryside. The loyalty of the East was jeopardized. The reports of Thalassius, the Praetorian prefect, and of Barbatio, the Caesar's count of the guard, at length moved Constantius to action. On the death of Thalassius, winter 353-4, the mission was sent to Antioch as his successor, directions being given him that Gallus was to be persuaded to visit the emperor in the west. The prefect studied discourtesy and overbearing behavior enraged the Caesar. The mission was thrown into prison, and the populace, responding to the appeal of Gallus, tore in pieces both the prefect and Montius, the quester of the palace. The trials for Trajan, which followed, were but a parody of justice. Fear and hate held sway in Antioch. Constantius himself now rode to Gallus, praying his presence in Milan. And deep foreboding the Caesar started. 
on his journey, the death of his wife, the emperor's masterful sister, further dismayed him, and after passing through Constantinople, his guard of honor became his jailers. Stripped of his purple by Barbatio in Petovio, he was brought near Pola before a commission headed by Eusebius, the emperor's chamberlain, and bidden to account for his administration in the east. The court came to the required conclusion, and Gallus was beheaded. Thus, of the house of Constantine there only remained the emperor's cousin, Julian. Born, in all probability, in April 332, the child spent his early years in Constantinople. His mother, Basilina, daughter of the Praetorian prefect Anicius Julianus, died only a few months after the birth of her son, while his father, Julius Constantius, younger brother of Constantine the Great, perished in the massacre of 337. From this, Julian was spared by his extreme youth, and was thereupon removed to Nicomedia, and entrusted to the charge of a distant relative by name Eusebius, who was at the time bishop of the city. When seven years of age, his education was undertaken by Mardonius, a Scythian eunuch, perhaps a Goth, who had been engaged by Julian's grandfather to instruct Basilina in the works of Homer and Hesiod. Mardonius had a passionate love for the classical authors, and on his way to school the boy's imagination was fired by the old man's enthusiasm. Already Julian's love for nature was aroused. In the summer he would spend his time on a small estate which had belonged to his grandmother. It lay eight states from the coast, and contained springs and trees with a garden. Here, free from crowds, he would read a book in peace, looking up now and again upon the ships and the sea, while from an all, he tells us, there was a wide view over the town below, and thence beyond to the capital, the Propontis, and the distant islands. Suddenly, in 341 perhaps, both he and his brother Gallus were banished to Marcellum, a large and lonely imperial castle in Cappadocia, lying at the foot of Mount Argeus. Here, for six years, the two boys lived in seclusion, for none of their friends were allowed to visit them. Julian chaffed bitterly at this isolation. In one of his rare references to this period, he writes, We might have been in a Persian prison with only slaves for our companions. For a time, the suspicions of Constantia seemed to have gained the upper hand. At length, Julian was allowed to visit his birthplace, Constantinople. Here, while studying under Christian teachers as a citizen among citizens, his natural capacity, wit, and sociability rendered him dangerously popular. It was rumored that men were beginning to look upon the young prince as Constantia's successor. He was bidden to return to Nicomedia, 349 perhaps, where he studied philosophy and came under the influence of Libanius, although he was not allowed to attend the latter's lectures. The rhetorician dates Julian's conversion to Neoplatonism from this period. The mud-bespattered statues of the gods were set up in the great temple of Julian's soul. At last, in 351, when Gallus was created Caesar, the student was free to go where he would, and the pagan philosophers of Asia Minor seized their opportunity. One and all plotted to secure the complete conversion of the young prince. Adesius and Eusebius at Pergamum, Maximus and Chrysanthius at Ephesus, could hardly content Julian's hunger for the forbidden knowledge. It was at this time, 351-2, to two, when he was twenty years of age, as he himself tells us, that he finally rejected Christianity and was initiated into the mysteries of Mithras. The fall of Gallus, however, implicated the Caesar's brother, and Julian was closely watched and conducted to Italy. For seven months he was kept under guard, and during the six months which he spent in Milan, he had only one interview with Constantius, which was secured through the efforts of the Empress Eusebia. When at length he was allowed to leave the court and was on his way to Asia Minor, the trial of the tribune Marinus and of Africanus, governor of Pannonia Secunda, on a charge of high treason, inspired Constantius with fresh fears and suspicions. Messages reached Julian, ordering his return. But before his arrival at Milan, Eusebia had won from the emperor his permission for Julian to retire to Athens, 
love of study being in a characteristic which might with safety be encouraged in members of the royal house men may have seen in this visit to greece in three hundred fifty five but a banishment to julian nursing the perilous secret of his new-found faith the change must have been pure joy in hellas his true fatherland he was probably initiated into the eleusinian mysteries while he plunged with impetuous intensity into the life of the university it was not to be for long for he was soon recalled to sterner activities since the death of gallus the emperor had stood alone although no longer compromised by the excesses of his caesar he was still beset by the old problems which appeared to defy solution at this time the power of the central government in gaul had been still further weakened here sylvanus whose timely desertion of magnentius had contributed to the emperor's success at the battle of mersa had been appointed magister peditum he had won some victories over the alemanni but driven into Trezen by court intrigues had assumed the purple in cologne and fallen after a short reign of some twenty-eight days a victim of treachery august september three hundred fifty five perhaps in his own person constantius could not take the command at once in Rhaetia and in gaul and yet along the whole northern frontier he was faced with danger and difficulty he was haunted by the continual fear that some capable general might of his own motion proclaim himself augustus or like sylvanus be hounded into rebellion a military triumph often advantaged the captain more than his master and might have but little influence towards kindling anew the allegiance of the provincials a prince of the royal house could alone with any hope of success attempt to raise the imperial prestige in gaul it was thus statecraft and no sinister machination against his cousin's life which led constantius to listen to his wife and treaties he determined to banish suspicion and disregard the interested insinuations of the court eunuchs he would make of the philosopher scholar a caesar in whose person the loyalty of the west should find a rallying point and on whom its devotion might be spent in the emperor's absence julian once more arrived in milan summer three hundred fifty five but to him imperial favor seemed a thing more terrible than royal neglect eusebius summons to be of good courage was of no avail only the thought that this was the will of heaven steeled his purpose who was he to fight against the gods after some weeks on november sixth three hundred fifty five julian was clothed with the purple by constantius and enthusiastically acclaimed as caesar by the army before leaving the court, the Caesar married Helena, the youngest sister of Constantius. The union was dictated by policy, and she would seem never to have taken any large place in the life or thought of Julian. The position of affairs in Gaul was critical. Magnentius had withdrawn the armies of the West to meet Constantius, and horde after horde of barbarians had swept across the Rhine. In the north, the Salii had taken possession of what is now the province of Brabant. In the south, the Alemanni under Knodomar had defeated the Caesar Decentius and had ravaged the heart of Gaul. The rumor ran that Constantius had even freed the Alemanni from their oaths and had given them a bribe to induce them to invade Roman territory, allowing them to take for their own any land which their swords could win the story is probably a fabrication of julian and his friends but the fact of the barbarian invasion cannot be doubted in the spring of three hundred fifty four constantius crossed the jura and marched to the neighborhood of basil but the alemanni under gundomad and vadomar withdrew and a peace was concluded in three hundred fifty five arbidio was defeated near the lake of constance and the fall of sylvanus had for its immediate consequence the capture of cologne by the franks forty-five towns not to speak of lesser posts had been laid waste and the valley of the rhine was lost to the romans three hundred states from the left bank of the river the barbarians were permanently settled and their ravages extended for three times that distance the whole of elsass was in the hands of the alemanni 
the heads of the municipalities had been carried into slavery. Strasbourg, Brumath, Worms, and Mainz had fallen, while soldiers of Magnentius, who had feared to surrender themselves after their leader's death, roamed as brigands through the countryside and increased the general disorder. On December 1st, 355, Julian left Milan with a guard of 360 soldiers. In Turin he learned of the fall of Cologne, and thence advanced to Vienna, where he spent the winter training with rueful energy for his new vocation of a soldier. For the following year a combined scheme of operations had been projected. While the emperor, advancing from Rhaetia, attacked the barbarians in their own territory, Julian was to act as lieutenant to Marcellus, with directions to guard the approaches into Gaul, and to drive back any fugitives who sought to escape before Constantius. The neutrality of the Alemannic princes in the north had been secured in 354, while internal dissension among the German tribes favored the emperor's plans. The army in Gaul was ordered to assemble at Reims, and Julian accordingly marched from Vienna, reaching Autun on 24th June. That the barbarians should have constantly harried the Caesar's soldiers as they advanced through Auxerre and Troyes only serves to show how completely Gaul had been flooded by the German tribesmen. From Reims, where the scattered troops were concentrated, the army started for Elsace, pursuing the most direct route by Metz and Dieus and Tabern. Two legions of the rear guard were surprised on the march and were only with difficulty saved from annihilation. At this time, Constantius was doubtless advancing upon the right bank of the Rhine, for Julian at Brumath drove back a body of the Alemanni who were seeking refuge in Gaul. The Caesar then marched by Koblenz through the desolated Rhine Valley to Cologne. This city he recovered and concluded a peace with the Franks. The approach of winter brought the operations to a close, and Julian retired to Saint. Food was scarce, and it was difficult to provision the army. The Caesar's best troops, the Scutarii and Gentiles, were therefore stationed in scattered fortresses. The Alemanni had been driven by hunger to continue their raids through Gaul, and hearing of the weakness of the garrison, they suddenly swept down upon Saint. In this heroic defense of the town, Julian won his spurs as a military commander. For thirty days he withstood the attack until the Alemanni retired discomfited. Marcellus had probably already experienced the ambition and vanity of the Caesar, his independence and intolerance of criticism. An imperial prince was none too agreeable lieutenant. The general may even have considered that the emperor would not be deeply grieved if the fortune of war removed a possible menace to the throne. Whatever his reasons may have been, he treacherously failed to come to the relief of the besieged. When the news reached the court, he was recalled, and deprived of his command. Eutherius, sent by Julian from Gaul, discredited the calumnies of Marcellus, and Constantius silenced the malignant whispers of the court. Accepting his Caesar's protestations of loyalty, he created him supreme commander over the troops in Gaul. The actual gains won by the military operations of the year 356 may not have been great, but that their moral effect was considerable is demonstrated by the campaign of 357 and by the spirit of the troops at the Battle of Strasbourg. Above all, Julian was no longer an imperial figurehead. He now begins an independent career as general and administrator. In the spring of 357, Constantius, wishing to celebrate with high pomp and ceremony the twentieth year of his rule since the death of Constantine, visited Rome for the first time, April 28th to May 29th. The city filled him with awe and wonder, and he caused an obelisk to be raised in the Circus Maximus as a memorial of his stay in the capital. But to the historian, the main interest of his visit lies in the fact that, as a Christian emperor, Constantius removed from the Senate House the altar of victory. To the whole-hearted pagans, this altar came to stand for a symbol of the Holy Roman Empire, as they conceived it. It was an outward and visible sign of that bond which none might lose between Rome's hard-won greatness as a conquering nation and her loyalty to her historic faith. They clung to it with passionate devotion, and to a time-honored creed in stone, 
a creed at once political and religious, and thus, again and again, they struggled and pleaded for its retention or its restoration. The deeper meaning of what might seem a matter of trifling import must never be forgotten if we are to understand the earnest petition of Symmachus or the scorn of Ambrose. The pagan was defending the last trench, the destruction of the altar of victory meant for him that he could hold the fortress no longer. From Rome, the emperor was summoned to the Danube to take action against the Sarmatians, Suevi, and Quadi. He was unable to cooperate with Julian in person, but dispatched Barbatio, Magister Peditum, to Gaul in command of 25,000 troops. Julian was to march from the north, Barbatio was to make Augst near Basel his base of operations, and between the two forces the barbarians were to be enclosed. The choice of a general, however, foredoomed the plan of campaign to failure. Barbatio, one of the principal agents in the death of Gallus, was the last man to work in harmony with Julian. The Caesar, leaving Saint, concentrated his forces, only 13,000 strong, at Reims, and, as in the previous year, marched south to Alsace. Finding the pass of Tabern blocked, he drove the barbarians before him and forced them to take refuge in the islands of the Rhine. Barbatio had previously allowed a marauding band of Letai, laden with booty, to pass his camp and to cross the Rhine unscathed, and later, by false reports, he secured the dismissal of the tribunes by Nobodies and the future emperor Valentinian, whom Julian had ordered to dispute the robber's return. He now refused to supply the Caesar with boats. Light-armed troops, however, waded across the Rhine to the islands, and seizing the barbarians' canoes, massacred the fugitives. After this success, Julian fortified the pass of Zabern, and thus closed the gate into Gaul. He saddled garrisons in Elsass along the frontier line, and did all in his power to supply them with provisions, for Barbatio withheld all the supplies which arrived from southern Gaul. Having now secured his position, Julian received the amazing intelligence that Barbatio had been surprised by the Germans, had lost his whole baggage train, and had retreated in confusion to Augst, where he had gone into winter quarters. It must be confessed that this defeat of 25,000 men by a sudden barbarian foray seems almost inexplicable, unless it be that Barbatio was determined at all costs to refuse in any way to cooperate with the Caesar, and was surprised while on the march to Augst. Julian's position was one of great danger. The emperor was far distant on the Danube. The Alamanni, previously at variance among themselves, were now reunited. Gundamad, the faithful ally of Rome, had been treacherously murdered, and the followers of Valdemar had joined their fellow countrymen. Barbatio's defeat had raised the enemy's hopes, while Julian was unsupported, and had only some 13,000 men under his command. It was at this critical moment that a host of Alemannic tribesmen crossed the Rhine under the leadership of Nodomar, and encamped, it would seem, on the left bank of the river, close to the city of Strasbourg, which the Romans had apparently not yet recovered. On the third day after the passage of the stream had begun, Julian learned of the movement of the barbarians, and set out from Zabern on the military road to Brumath, and thence on the highway which ran from Strasbourg to Mainz towards Weitbruch. Here, after a march of six or seven hours, the army would reach the frontier fortification, and from this point they had to descend by rough and unknown paths into the plain. On sight of the enemy, despite the counsels of the Caesar, Despite their long march and the burning heat of an August day, the troops insisted on an immediate attack. The Roman army was drawn up for battle. Severus on rising ground on the left wing, Julian in command of the cavalry on the right wing in the plain. Severus from this point of vantage discovered an ambush and drove off the barbarians with loss, but the Alamanni, in their turn, routed the Roman horse. Although Julian was successful in staying their flight, they were too demoralized to renew the conflict. The whole brunt of the attack was therefore borne by the Roman center and left wing, and it was a struggle of footmen against footmen. At length the stubborn endurance of the Roman infantry carried the day, 
and the Alamani were driven headlong backwards toward the Rhine. Their losses were enormous. Six thousand left dead on the field of battle, and countless others drowned. Nodomar was at last captured, and Julian sent the redoubtable chieftain as a prisoner to Constantius. The victory meant the recovery of the Upper Rhine and the freeing of Gaul from barbarian incursions. There would even seem to have been an attempt after the battle to hail Julian as Augustus, but this he immediately repressed. The booty and captives were sent to Metz, and the Caesar himself marched to Mainz, being compelled to subdue a mutiny on the way. The army had apparently been disappointed in its share of the spoil. Julian at once proceeded to cross the Rhine opposite Mainz and to conduct a campaign on the main. His aim would seem to have been to strike still deeper terror into the vanquished, and to secure his advantage in order that he might feel free to turn to the work which awaited him in the north. Three chieftains sued for peace after their land had been laid waste with fire and sword, and to seal this success, Julian rebuilt a fortress which Trajan had constructed on the right bank of the Rhine. The great difficulty which faced the Caesar was the question of supplies, and one of the terms of the ten months' armistice granted to the Alamanni was that they should furnish the garrison of the Munimentum Traiani with provisions. It was this pressing necessity which demanded both an assertion of the power of Rome among the peoples dwelling about the mouths of the Moise and Rhine, and also the re-establishment of the regular transport of corn from Britain. During the campaign on the main, Severus had been sent north to reconnoitre. The Franks now occupied a position of virtual independence in the district south of the Moise, and in the absence of Roman garrisons, and with the Caesar fully occupied by the operations against the Alamanni, a troop of six hundred Frankish warriors were devastating the countryside. They retired before Severus and occupied two deserted fortresses. Here, for fifty-four days, in December 357 and January 358, they were besieged by Julian, who had marched north to support the Magister Equitum. Hunger compelled them at last to yield, for the relief sent by their fellow tribesmen arrived too late. Julian spent the winter in Paris, and in early summer advanced with great speed and secrecy, surprised the Franks in Toxandria, and forced them to acknowledge Roman supremacy. Further north, the Camavi had been driven by the pressure of the Saxons in their rear to cross the Rhine and to take possession of the country between that river and the Moise. The cooperation of Severus enabled Julian to force them to submission, and it would appear that in consequence they retired to their former homes on the Isel. The lower Rhine was now once more in Roman hands. The generalship of Julian had achieved what the prefect Florentius had deemed that Roman gold could alone secure, and the building of a fleet of four hundred sea-going vessels was at once begun. The lower Rhine secured, Julian forthwith, July and August, returned to his unfinished task in the south. It was imperative that the ravaged provinces of Gaul should be repeopled. Their desolation and the honor of the empire alike demanded that the prisoners in the hands of the barbarians should be restored. The remorseless ravaging of his land compelled Horterius to yield, to surrender his Roman captives, and to furnish timber for the rebuilding of the Roman towns. The winter passed, Julian once more left Paris, and with his new fleet brought the corn of Britain to the garrisons of the Rhine. Seven fortresses, from Castra Hercules in the land of the Batavi to Bingen in the south, were reconstructed, and then, in a last campaign against the most southerly tribes of the Alamanni, those chieftains who had taken a leading part in the Battle of Strasbourg were forced to tender their submission. It was no easy matter to secure the release of the Roman prisoners, but Julian could claim to have restored twenty thousand of these unfortunates to their homes. The Caesar's work was done. Gaul was once more in peace, and the Rhine the frontier of the empire. End of section 8